Thanks for joining us on the King Law Podcast, where we give you a lawyer's perspective on anything legal or not. From criminal law, personal injury, and trending legal topics, we're your back pocket legal guide. Uh, <laughs> should we go to makeup first? Is there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> is you there? Is that, a, is that an option? Wait, you know, like Kim Kardashian had a CJI tier that was placed in Jesus. one of the episodes, and everyone knew it was fake because she went to go wipe, and the tear was still there. Oh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. This is way more, this is fancier than I expected. I thought it was, I don't know what I thought. <laughs> the, um, I, I'm writing your interview questions. Oh, good. We're really prepared. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually looking at the TV, what this reminds me of is that Saturday Night Live skit, um, the Schweddy Balls skit, oh. <laughs> you know. What, what about this? This is New get... Hampshire Public Radio. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, yeah. fu- oddly enough, that's Alec Baldwin. Oh, that's boy. Alec Baldwin oh. in that. Oh, my God. What do you think about the whole situation? Do you have a take on this? Yeah, Bobby and I just watched that watched the CNN report. Like, I, I wish the prosecution a lot of luck on that one. I really do. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't know how you get from manslaughter to out of, like, not checking a prop gun. Right. You know, isn't that the prop master's job to check the prop gun? I don't know. That would be my This opinion. is as close to a know. movie as I've ever been in right here. So <laughs> the Bob, Bob King podcast, Bob King and Friends podcast. Yeah. And friends. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, all right, let's do it. Um, so Welcome. we always started out. We started out, I always do a little introduction. Okay. So today, I don't know where we're at, episode uh, 29 or 30 maybe. Nice. Our, Hopefully it's 30. Yeah. Sabres yeah. retired Ryan Miller's number last night. So Were you at the game? No, Bree. Thanks for asking. Uh, I was invited uh, to not only go to the game but sit in a suite, uh, and I had to pass on that because I had what? to visit. Yeah, I had to visit the Chai Lai, uh, Parenton, and oh my gosh, they're all blending together at this point. Chai Lai, Parenton, and Henrietta Republican committees Hold last on. night. Which before was you go crazy, before you go crazy. Let's introduce. Okay. Ma- Matthew J. Rich. <laughs> all right. Who are you? <laughs> yeah. Who Matthew J. Rich. Who are any of us? Rock. And uh, so I always start everybody with a story, one of my favorite stories, and I have oh a lot God. of good Matty Rich stories, but I was, uh, Matt was a friend of mine and then became my supervisor when I was a young lawyer. I apologize. And, yes. Don't blame uh, me. He was a great supervisor. Mm, thanks, Bobby. And uh, one particular evening, I was in Rochester City Court, part one, I had a big backlog of cases, and uh, Matt Rich comes into my office and says, you need to get this cleaned up, and I'll be here tomorrow morning, and it better be taken care of. And uh, so I said, all right, around 11 p.m., I'm still sitting there working. Mm-hmm. The uh, the elevator dings, and I'm like, who in the hell is here? I thought it was maybe a janitor or something. In comes Matt Rich and says, oh, I was just making sure you took this serious. And then we sat there uh, with, with another one of our buddies, yep. Joe Waldorf, mm-hmm. until about 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, go take a shower. I expect right. you back here at 8.30 in the morning. And, and mm-hmm. uh got it done so that was uh, Matt Rich the boss uh, well I mean the pause on that you know Waldorf and I were coming from church um, <laughs> when um, we decided to stop at the office um, tell your next story and I'll I'll, I'll follow up on it. I did well, hopefully it doesn't top that one no no that's the, the one story so Matt, mm-hmm. Matt a very experienced prosecutor mm-hmm. Has gone into private practices. Tell us a little, to, you know, sure. inter- introduce yourself, where you are today, and what you're doing, and all that. Kind yeah. Of stuff. Um, well, I'm at, at, at the core of it, Bobby, I'm just a kid from Greece, New York. Um, I'm amazed that I, I've gotten to this point in my life, which is um, some of the things I get to see and some of the things I get to do as a lawyer are absolutely blow my mind sometimes. But um, I, I do have a, a solo practice. I run my own office. Uh, my office is in the uh, First Federal Building uh, over here in downtown Rochester. Uh, I've been in private practice for coming up on 12 years now. And next month, I will have been a lawyer for 19 years, which is, I was talking uh, with another friend of ours this morning, Frank Charty, who was sworn in the same day I was. And I, I have no idea where the time went. I have no clue. It has flown by. And um I was very blessed uh, to start my career. I worked at uh, a firm called Woods Oviat Gilman here in Rochester for the first year out of law school. 
Um, I'm very proud that I got to work there. It's one of the most uh, prominent firms in the city. But when, um, when an opportunity came up to join the DA's office, I, I took it. Um, at the time, um, uh, my, one of my friends, one of my best friends, Pat Farrell, um, was at the DA's office. And, and the reason that I wound up over there is uh, there was a, a group of, of uh, assistant district attorneys leaving um, at once, which was almost unheard of at, 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 at those times. Ironically, one of those people... Um, is the husband of Judge Ruhlman, Ray Ruhlman, who uh, is going to be running in this election uh, with me. So, um, you know, Steve Serkiw was one of them, uh, Alicia Elston, a few others. But it, Pat called me up and said, if you're ever going to do this, here's your chance. And so I sent my resume over. I remember it distinctly. I got a call from Larry Bernstein, who was the second assistant at the time. Uh, Larry, in and of himself, was an absolute legend. Um, Larry hired me. I was the last person he ever hired. He goes, look, I've hired over 200 people. <laughs> You're the last one. Don't fuck up. Oh, my God. <laughs> that that well, was the call. The, th the thing about Larry is one, one of the things that we later on, we, we used to eat lunch at Antonetta's every single Wednesday when, on J Street, Antonetta's Italian restaurant, which uh, is long gone by now, but finally remembered. But That was for the people who don't know. They called that Big Boy Lunch. Big Boy Lunch, yeah. And, and they, would, they would give us these. So we'd be in our suits and ties, and they'd give us these bibs. And they must have got a discount on a set of them from a seafood restaurant because they had the ones with the lobster <laughs> on it. So from the first time we got those from that day forward, he was Larry the Lobster <laughs> until the day he left <laughs> the DA's office. Uh, um, hopefully, hopefully Larry's doing good and he sees this. Um, but, but in any case, I, I got the call from Larry, and uh, I was extremely fortunate uh, to get that job. Uh, it it reinvigorated my passion for the law and frankly speaking it changed the traje trajectory of my life um i loved every single minute i spent there from the first day to the last and uh i am eternally proud to have worked there um by the time you came on board bobby that was um i had i had worked well actually no you you came on board when i was still working in child abuse um, and domestic violence. Yeah, and so, so that was kind of cool because we got to be friendly. We skied together oh, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. went out. There was We were always going out to another happy hour or whatever it was. No, so no, I, church, Bobby. We yeah, went to church. church. Yeah, we went to church. Uh, right. Bingo when we wanted to get crazy. <laughs> the, uh, bingo. <laughs> bingo at the church, Bree. Oh, so, okay. so I already know Manny Rich. Then he becomes my boss. And, uh, and he's like, look. The athlete and you can talk about your, your career but he was he was gonna he had not been in Boston he was gonna be a boss and he's like look you're, you're I'm gonna be a tough boss and he was and in a very good way to make all of us better so Bob you are undoubtedly one of the people that I'm the most proudest to say and I know my English is poor there but I, I am unbelievably proud of everything you have accomplished um, if I played a tiny role in that um, that is extremely gratifying. Um, here, here we are, and, and actually, if you're watching this on YouTube, I, I wish you could turn the camera around and see what this actually is. I was joking with Bob that I feel like I'm on between two firms with Gail Kanakis here, but uh, <laughs> we do have a plant between two. Between two, <laughs> is it living, Bree? Uh, and I, anyways, I digress. Um, you know, your success is incredible. Um, you have become one of the most prominent attorneys in Rochester. Um, I look around, and I was thinking about it this morning, I knew, knowing that this was going to come up. You know, I look around at all of the people that I was fortunate enough to have supervised, and, 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 I, and among those people, I mean, we have superior court judges at this point. We have people that have gone on to have tremendously successful um, private practice you know, situations. We have people that have gone on to, to be, um, you know, it, working in government agencies. Um, it is amazing. And I, 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 it's funny, I was talking to another friend of ours the other day, Jason McBride, about this. It's amazing the amount of talent that we worked with there when there, you think about there's it. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot of talent that comes out of law schools. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, just thinking back, and it was Kitty and you and Jason yeah. and, and, a lot of really talented attorneys, uh, but the thing we always focused on. Tell them to call well, back later. Yeah, sorry. Uh, You're sure. in high demand, Robert. Yeah, That's sure. why they're, you know. Was the evidence. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. you know, it was the evidence. It was jury selection. It was organization. It was it was really nuts and bolts stuff of law. And, and mm -hmm. 
the all the fancy stuff. We didn't worry about the fancy stuff. We were talking about the evidence and the proof. Yeah. The evidence and the proof. Yeah. Can we prove it? Can we not prove it? And how are we going to prove it and convey that to whether it's a judge or jury? Just the nuts and bolts, yeah. basics. And then when, when you have talented people and you teach them, the, mm-hmm. I think most people actually lack in the basics. Well, I'm I'm going to give um, I'm going to give two people credit for that as really being kind of the, our guiding light with that. The, the first is now County Court Judge Doug Randall who was my boss in when I got to uh, domestic violence and child abuse. The second would be now Ontario County Court Judge Kitty Carley, who was uh, was his deputy and also my boss when I got to domestic violence and uh, child abuse. They always emphasized to those of us in the Bureau the craftsmanship of doing a trial, that there was more to it than being a presenter of evidence and simply putting your exhibits in and hoping the chips fell where they may. Kitty especially was constantly seeking out new and innovative ways to present the evidence we had. And and quite frankly, you know this, Bob, in a lot of those cases we tried in child abuse, a lot of the times all you had was the word of the child, right? We didn't have DNA. We didn't often did not have a statement from the defendant and we were constantly encouraged and constantly worked together to get creative and, and find ways to do the job better. And it has done nothing other than to make all of us, myself, yourself, better trial lawyers, even, even to this day. I mean, some of the, I think of some of the things that we worked on and the trainings we went to. I mean, heck, we went, you went out of town with us multiple times. I, I, I went to... Huntsville, Alabama. I remember that yeah, one time. Winona, Minnesota. Winona, Minnesota. Week. Dallas. Oh my God, that Dallas con- convention was was huge. I, I was fortunate enough to go to the National District Attorney Center in Columbia, South Carolina, um, and 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 take training there. But as a group in child abuse, we were constantly looking for that edge, and yes, we were it's, constantly it's trying to find it. I've been doing these Camp Lejeune cases and mm-hmm. go to the national conference, and there's some really, really good mm-hmm. lawyers at these conferences, and, and you sit down and you meet some of these people, and, uh, and I always feel like we're on equal footing with the people who, you, when you start talking about yeah. the strategy of how we're going to prove up this toxic exposure and it sure. caused cancer, and we're getting our documents yep. together and our medical records, and you know we're from a small town, and, mm-hmm. and we don't have 100 lawyers that work here, and they go, how do you know all this stuff? And and I always text Kitty after I leave, and I'm like, "Hey, thanks for making me a real lawyer." Like it plays, yeah. it plays everywhere, and yeah. you, you get your evidence together and you you put it out there. Yeah. And if you, there's elements to yep. whatever it is, you mm-hmm. prove it or you can't prove it, and it's not always as complicated as people think it is. No, it's uh, it, a lot of it is elbow grease. It's preparation. It's it's making sure that you've got your ducks in a row before you go into the courtroom. I mean, it was. You know, I always think about, it was probably Michael Jordan or Vince Lombardi or somebody like that. They always talk about how you practice the way you play, meaning that if you make your practices harder, by the time you get to the game, you're going to be that just more prepared. And whoop, 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 there we go. There goes the electronics. Sorry. It's fine. Just, well, As I said, <laughs> Jesus, I knew I was going to do that. Anyways, hopefully we can edit that out. Yeah, can on. we grab a, a paper towel? <laughs> Ah. Cut. <laughs> I was rolling too. Darn it. It's fine. We just gotta clean it. Sorry about that. Thank you. I got my I could talk with my hands, which is the problem. Yeah, it's not the most comfortable, like we'll get that. The cords and the this no, and that. I didn't I don't think I, I spilled I think it mainly went on the ground. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Get the the quicker picker upper here. Okay, sorry about that. All right. You know, Kale didn't spill when she came in here. There we go. All right, sorry about that. Anyways, it did not go on the... Didn't hit the electronics. Didn't hit the electronics. Thank you. Sorry, Bree. Sorry. I don't think you're also supposed... You're not supposed to wear this kind of stuff. It, like, digitizes. You're fine. All right, sorry about that. We'll... we'll where was I? <laughs> Michael two. Jordan. Michael Take Jordan, it. Vince Lombardi. You play the way you practice, baby. Just give it a second, and then you can start it on the sentence. Maybe we can... Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know if it was you or a different boss that said to me, court's supposed to be a formalization mm -hmm. of what you did before court. You're not supposed to go to court right. and see what happens. Any, any lawyer who says, let's go to court and see what happens, that's probably not the guy you want. Well, before I spilled my water all over your electronics, Bob, <laughs> I was making a, um, a, a comparison to, I'm pretty sure it was Lombardi who, who had said about, you know, the, you practice the way you play. You make the practices so hard that by the time you get to the game, you're super prepared. And that's, I think, the way that we went about putting our cases together. We, we, I think about some of the things we, we did, where we would go, where we would meet the complaining witnesses of victims, the work with the police officers. I mean, you know, more often than not, we were going over to the police agencies and, and getting right in, the, in their office with them to get them ready to testify. And, you know, that, the subject matter was tough, and it, it didn't always yield, you know, d just doing that didn't guarantee you were going to get the result you were looking for. But it put you in a position where if, if, if things went right and you got the right jury, you could get a good result. And that's what I was always, that's a, that was always impressed on me by my superiors. And I think by the time that I was in a position to work with young lawyers, um, that's what I wanted to always impress on all of you. And... Uh, I mean, Bob, your 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 record of success both inside the office and since then is a testament to that approach. I know how you prepare a case. I know because we we've worked on a number of cases together. Um, you know, since we've both been out of the uh, district attorney's office, and I don't know another way to do it. It's not easy. It's not quick. It's not. It's not the. Uh, it, it's a labor intensive thing, but that's that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. Yeah, so I want to talk about, I, I got some notes here of things sure. I want to talk to you about. And, um, oh, I don't know if it was a year or two ago, you were involved in Daniel Prude defense oh, case. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you did a press conference, and a, a lot of you know, attorneys who I respect were there. Yep. And and I remember, obviously, I've thought pretty highly of your skills as an attorney for a long time, and I, I know who you are, and we've mm -hmm. referred cases to you and all kinds of stuff like that. But... So this press conference, there's there's a lot of lawyers up, up there, and it was pretty clear to me Matt Rich stood out that day, just did a fabulous job. Well, Nobles the put the spit sock on. I Whoa. think that's what everybody remembers from that. It, it was just, it, that it was a very uh, tumultuous time yeah. in our city, yeah. and there were people that were rushing to conclusions, I think, mm -hmm. and there were aggressive questions from the press, which they deserved to ask and should yeah. have asked. Mm -hmm. And in one question after the next was answered by Matt Rich in a way that was respectful, in a way that was fair to the evidence. And uh, so just talk to us a little bit about that day and, and preparing yeah. for that moment, um, being involved with yeah. the uh, Locust Club and all that kind of stuff. Let me start by saying this, okay? Um, I, I was, I've been born and raised here in Rochester, New York. Um, in my childhood, probably the early 80s, I think a lot of people would tell you was when Rochester was at its at its best. Um, Kodak was flush. Um, my dad worked at Kodak. Um, it was a vibrant, growing community. It was a center of technology. Um, we have been since that time dealt one blow after another. Um, this community. You think about the last thirty years in this community. Um, it's been it's been one unlucky break after another. And that brought us to March of, uh, of 2020. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know a lot of police officers, Bob. I know a lot of police officers. I'm personal friends with some of my closest friends, uh, guys that I, I hang out with, um, you know, weekly or more um, are police officers. And... What they have to see and endure and absorb on a daily basis absolutely blows my mind. And it, it's amazing that they still have the courage and the fortitude to get up and do their jobs every morning. That particular situation was, it was like a set of dominoes falling. It was one thing led to the next thing, which led to the next thing, which led to the next thing. So you get a call. I get a call. I get a call from it was Nobles who called me and said, you know, look, 
there's going to be seven of these officers, and they're all mixed up in this thing. And, and by then... James Noble, he's a defense yeah, attorney. Defense he attorney. represents yeah. the Locust Club sometimes. And I was, you know, I had heard... I mean, I think you would say the same. We had heard early that year in April or May that, that, that there was a fatality, but nobody really knew anything about it. Um, so you had COVID. I mean, that was at the right at the beginning of COVID where, you know, everyone was locked up in their houses. The tension was high. Everything was pent up. And, and it was Rochester in after 2019 and 2020, which the last four or five years have been just so tragically violent in our city. Um, and, you know, in a snowstorm, here comes this man running down West Main Street, you know, naked, um, in, in, a, in a state where, you know, he's, you know, almost impervious to the elements, almost impervious to pain. Now, now by, by, by now, you know, we know what happened. I mean, he, he comes from Chicago. There's a mental health history there. He had ingested PCP, which you and I in our work have come to learn is, I mean, it, it essentially sets your system on fire. That's what happened. I mean, and, you know, he, he's mental health arrested early in the afternoon. He's released pretty quickly from the hospital. He gets back out in the evening. Um, we think ingested more PCP at that point. And, you know, come the early morning hours, here he is on Jefferson Avenue. Now, you know, I, I, strangely enough, at that point, the city, the police department, in, in working with the state agency that, you know, administers this, had, had instituted a new use of force policy. And the technique that they used was exactly what they had all been trained to use. Um, I will maintain to my dying day that he did not choke. It was not a mental health crisis, as it's been described in the media. His system was on fire. And all it took was just the minimum level of physical contact to put him over the edge. And it was a tragedy, which then in turn ignited a bigger fire in our community that had been pent up for a long time, going back to you know what I'm talking about, that, that sort of the, the one bad break after another this community has faced since I was a kid. And a lot of pent up rage came out um, you had people, I think, talking past each other, not to each other, talking past each other. There were people who wanted to exploit what happened for their own agendas, um, to air their own grievances. And it was a horrible, awful time. And that led up to that day in October when, you know, we went up for that press conference. Now, Bob, you have seen most, if not all, the big trials I've ever been involved in. Um, I can tell you without any reservation, at that podium was the most nervous I have ever been. I remember it distinctly. I remember thinking while I was at the podium, I can't believe how nervous you are right now. You know, you've stood in front of, I don't know how many juries, how many judges over the years and, and talked. Why is this any different? And in the press, you, you're familiar with the press. Yeah, You've talked to the press yeah. many times. Well, it, Waldorf always jokes. You know, he's like, where's the most dangerous place in the world between Matt Rich and a news camera? <laughs> um, he's got a lot of jokes. That's our, our buddy Joe. But, uh, no, that day, um, you know, you got to understand that we we'll let into it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer from Rochester. No, this is not a major city in America. It's a city in America, but not a, it's not Chicago, L.A., Philadelphia. We're the 51st biggest right. m media market. I I'm talking to reporters from the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN. And I mean, it's, it's, I still can't believe that all of that transpired. But at the end of it, you know, I've got, I happen to have four guys. Um, the other three lawyers each had an individual defendant. And their lives have never been, I mean, my clients' lives have never been the same. Um, I know that the other officers involved, that, that, that night will never totally be gone from, from their, their memory. And everything that happened after, I mean, there were f several of them had people come to their house. I mean, people published these guys' addresses. 
But, you know, I knew that somebody had to speak up for them because... And so the, for the people who don't know, this is a, a person who deceased in mm -hmm. Rochester while he was being detained by the police department at a time right. where there were some really horrible things yeah. that happened in other cities throughout the United yeah. States. George Floyd in, in Minneapolis, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, um, Breonna Taylor down in, in, in Tennessee, um, gentleman's name in, in um, the well, Bronx, I think, down in New York City, slips, yeah. slips my mind. And, but that and, was the... That was the people jumped to some conclusions. Yeah. But you get this call. Mm -hmm. Just So you get the call, and you don't know. I mean, just like every other case, right? right? You do not know. When the phone call comes in, you don't know what happened. What, no. Like, as an attorney... I mean, I don't know. I'm worried about what's true, what's not true. Right. And, like, what do you do? Um, you're going to laugh at me. This is what I did. So this is still pandemic, and we're still mainly at home. I remember distinctly getting on the Peloton. <laughs> you're going to laugh. I, I, I got the call early in the afternoon, and I, we weren't in the office, so I had to work out that day. So I got on the bike, and I got a text, hey, turn the TV on. And I turned the TV on, and it was the press conference where the mayor um, had to discuss what had happened after some time having not discussed what happened. And I'm on, you know, I'm on the bike, and I'm I'm pedaling, and I'm just like, "Holy crap! What 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 have I what have I just walked into here? This is I knew immediately, given everything we talked about, this was going to be a national." story. This was not going to be a local thing. And, you know, the, the heart rate goes up at that point. But I was very proud to be, and I still am very proud to be um, associated with the Locust Club. I'm proud to represent their members when I'm called upon to do it. My admiration for those guys and gals that, that you know, are out there trying to protect us is endless. The thing that I wish people would recognize and realize is police officers are human beings, okay? You want to talk about any profession, any profession. There are people in any profession who don't always live up to the... I mean, look at us, lawyers. There are, there are lawyers who don't always live up to the ideals of our calling. There are not many of them. I mean, I probably I could count on less than one hand in this community people that, you know, don't are, are not worthy of the title. And it's the same with police officers. All right. Sure, there are probably bad police officers, but I gotta tell you, Bob, I don't know many of them. And the ones I do know, I don't know what gets them out of bed and into uniform every day. I really don't, especially in the city. Those officers have no one other than the Locust Club to support them. No one has their backs. It's almost, in some cases, guilty until proven innocent. And, you know, I know James is, is still doing work for the club. I'm still doing work for the club. Um, it's something I'm extremely proud of. And I was extremely proud to stand with those officers in, in the Daniel Prude situation but again, it was a it was a tragedy, all around. It was, it was a horrible, horrible situation, and you know, um, we're still healing from it in this community. We absolutely still are. I, I mean, I we'll move on here, but I remember we watched that interview, mm -hmm. and and Greg and I, I think watched it in the office, and and I said, everybody knows Maddie Rich now. <sighs> they, I. You know, I, I, mean, I and I remember that I think one of your comments was that they got some guy who was in his police car down the road. <laughs> yeah, they there was uh, <laughs> that was uh, Mazio's going to kill me when I tell this story. Um, at the time, there wasn't a lock on the front door of the Locust Club <laughs> because it's why would you need one? But um, there were a few people that got in that day for the press conference, and and we actually we took their questions, but outside um, they there was a, a protest in the parking lot and, and people might be confused just because it, it represents Rochester police officers. It's private property. And folks were asked to, you know, go stand on the sidewalk, you know, don't, 
this is, you know, private property and they wouldn't go. And, you know, they got basically arrested for trespass or disorderly conduct or whatever the case may be. But I remember one of the girls that was in there, one of the ladies, excuse me, that was in there, um, who was in there and shouldn't have been, had asked me, did you know that so-and-so had just got arrested in the parking lot? And I, I really, I, I, sometimes I turned into a wise guy and I was like, ma'am, I'm, I've been in here the whole time. I don't know what happens out there. Um, it was uh, it was a wild time. It was uh, something I'm always going to remember. Hmm. We got from Matt. You got uh, anything on your mind? Well, I'm just thinking back about how you were talking about helping young attorneys, mm -hmm. and so do you have any advice to young attorneys or law students? Like yeah, thinking back to this, your law school days, what would you want to tell a law student? Or tell yourself when you were yeah. 22 years old. I think when you're in law school, the recruiting offices, at least the time, or the, the career offices at the time I was there, put a big emphasis on going to work in a private firm right out of the, right out of the gate. And there's nothing wrong with that, believe me. And, and you know, that's it, what you did. It's what I did. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily in the area of law that I was interested in, right? If your desire is to be a litigator, if your desire is to spend your days in a courtroom, if you come here or you go to Buffalo, because those are the two places that I know the best, you really only have two options. You have to start at the DA's office or the public defender's office or the conflict defender's office for that matter. Because those are the only places at that early stage of your career where you're going to you know, wind up in, in a courtroom um, right off the bat. And you're gonna gain experience and, and make friendships and connections that you're not going to be able to make from anywhere else, anywhere else. And I suppose it should be said, you know, we, we, we've talked about the DA's office a lot so far today. Our public defender's office is equally as good of a training ground um, for some of the absolute tip-top attorneys in this community. It still is. Um, you know, I think back to when I started, I think in my first week, this is, this is, this is a story I'll always remember. Um, First week in the office. I, to that point, about you know, 14 months into my legal career, I'd been in a courtroom by myself exactly once. And it was for a gentleman who wanted to put his lottery winnings in a trust in Penn Yan. So not exactly a contentious um, proceeding. But, but first couple of days I'm in there, they assigned me to Webster Town Court. And my boss at the time was Tim Prosperi, who later on went on to be the second assistant district attorney in the office. Great trial lawyer, Tim was. Unbelievable. Um, and what it was was a, a fatality. It was, it, was a, it was a stoplight ticket or stop sign ticket. But guy went through the stop sign at State Road and 250, I think, in – no, State Road and Jackson in Webster. And he was driving east, and he was driving into the sun. It was a truck driver, one of those sort of box trucks with the flat front on it. And he, a car turned left in front of him. He didn't see it. So they charged him with failure to yield right away and, you know, running a stop sign. And we prepped for that thing like it was a murder trial. Tim walked me through it. And I remember going out there and I was, shake, I was shaking like a leaf. I couldn't believe it. So <laughs> we did this trial in front of Judge Salvo, And, uh, you know, that unfortunately, the, you know, the, the guy was found guilty because that's what happened. But he was, the, the person who had died, you know, passed away. The insurance company sent someone to defend this poor guy, and he, he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk. And I, I just remember thinking to myself, like, I, I, this, is, this is as heavy as it gets. Like, what, they're going to trust me to do this? I, I, and they did. And that's what, you, they, off you go. And you got to figure it out, right? Oh, yeah. here's, a, here's a thousand files. You control yeah. people's freedom. Right. Don't uh, just do don't, it. Don't, don't <laughs> mess up. Screw up, pal. Don't mess up. Yeah. Do justice, right? <laughs> what I always tell you guys: do justice. Do the right thing. It's not always about your record, your trial record. I was always suspicious of people coming and telling me, "Oh, I won six or seven in a row." And what I would always say in response is, "Then you're not trying the hard ones. You're 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 doing layups." You know. I it's, like that. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Just in general, too. Yeah. Yeah, the, there was, an, I don't know who it was we, we were talking to, and, and I said, the people who, it's kind of the same thing, good lawyers have lost a lot more trials oh, yeah. 
than bad lawyers because the good lawyers will take hard cases. Take the risk. And yeah. I mean, we Reese's the case, the civil cases we're mm-hmm. taking, people are badly injured and we think we can get there and we take really hard cases and, and yeah. mm-hmm. usually you figure out a way to do it. And you know, yep. sometimes does that put you at risk for losing? Sure. Well, what's the alternative? You tell a person we're not gonna take your case and they have no lawyer and nobody fights for right. it. Right. I mean, it's, that, that, you know, Bree, to answer your question, I think Bob hit the nail right on the head. It, uh, it's not always a question of a certain victory. If you're out there and you're saying, well, I'm only going to take the ones that I know are, are, are lead pipe cinches, there's not much of an art to that, in my opinion. Now, you try to resolve things and try to, you know, you know, it's... A, what would you say? Ninety-five percent of what we do never never reaches that stage. At least, and you try to be reasonable. But um, in the if you have a good lawyer, I, I always love going against somebody who I think is a good mm-hmm. lawyer. Now I'm doing plaintiff's personal injury, sure. and we're going against. Mm-hmm. I want to go against a really good defense lawyer because they know what they got. And, yeah. And mm-hmm. if it's a good lawyer on the other side, I remember one case in particular. I call a defense lawyer, and it's a woman with a lot of experience, mm-hmm. and she says, "Let's let's spare ourselves." You're going to say this, then I'm going to say this, and you're going to say this, then I'm going to say this. And she like, we'll just not do that. Yeah. And we're going to do our work. And then in six months, we're going to resolve this case for $475,000. And you know what happened? In six months, we resolved that case for $475,000. Isn't that funny? And, uh, <laughs> and that, that's like, the, you know, that's... Or you go against some schmucko and fight for <laughs> five years. It's not many and, schmuckos. There are some, but they're well, not, you know, you know, they're out there. Baby lawyers. Sorry. Some of them, they haven't uh, got the experience yet. Yeah. And, you know, I sympathize with that, too, because, you know, I'm, we're out there and, you know, frankly, a lot of the, you know, being a defense attorney at this point, a lot of the prosecutors are brand new. And I remember when I was brand new, I was a, look, I was a freaking punk. All right. <laughs> I, I'm going to say right off the bat, I was a freaking punk. And I remember, you know, there were some times when I let my temper get the, the, the rest of me, or the best of me. I mean, I had to learn that this wasn't a hockey game. All right, you know that's that was my sport you growing that two up. Two or three years ago. Yeah, no, it's not that well. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, maybe every once in a while. But you know, it's sometimes when you don't know what you're doing, there's two choices: you can either get aggressive or you can shy away from it. And I admire aggressiveness. I do, uh, but I but I admire more when you make a mistake, then you learn from it. Because you, I think that's the other thing I always told you guys, which is the only way to learn in this job. You can sit down and study the books all you want. You got to get kicked in the you know what's a few times. Right. That's how you learn. Fake it till you make it, right? Something <laughs> along those lines, or be a jerk until you make it. I yeah. guess. Um, well, okay. I want to talk about why you weren't at the Sabres game. Oh Lord. Let's go uh, into this. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm a, among other teams, a huge Sabres fan and uh, huge Bills fan too. But uh, the Sabres have sucked for a decade terrible. Mm -hmm. They are fun and decently good this year. They're doing very well. So last night they retired the jersey of their goalie from the last time when they were good before that decade of pure suck that we've just been through. That's Um, why I'm a Penguins fan. Well, yeah, you guys (laughs) have like one bad year and then you get Sidney Crosby to replace Mario Lemieux. I love him. (laughs) Yeah, that must be nice. But but in any event, um, so my, my, one of my good friends from law school still works in practices in Buffalo, invites me and says, not only does he have a ticket for me, but he sprang for a suite at the Sabres game. Now, I have never sat in a suite at the Sabres game. I'm more of a 300-level uh, guy uh, with a warm beer and a pretzel. So this is up, a, this is up a, a, another level. But, no, I had, to, I had to respectfully decline because I'm out on the campaign trail right now, and I had the privilege of visiting – uh, the Henrietta, Parenton, uh, I knew I was going to forget the third, Chi Lai, forgive me, Chi Lai, town of Chi Lai, Republican committees last night. Wow, that's which, which dedication. Was, well, it, you know, I did listen to the game on the radio if that, while I was driving between these places. But, no, it was, it was totally worth it. Um, in fact, the last stop last night was Parenton. And um, there's a gentleman there by the name of Bob Barker who was uh, has been the, uh, in the leadership group there for over 30 years. And last night was the meeting where he was stepping aside from the leadership. And he gave this retrospective speech 
that was absolutely unbelievable. And and Bobby, the the leader in parenting is a, a, a mutual friend of ours, Joe Shenley. Yep. Um, I know Joe is very you're you're very close with Joe, especially with some of the things you're doing to help the the veterans. Um, but you know, I'm out there and I'm listening to this man who is a giant in in parenting politics and Republican politics in the county, and I was like, you know, this is what it's all about. It's all about service. And his whole speech, I don't think he talked about himself once. He, he thanked this litany of people um, who he had worked with over the years, and it was really cool. And I'm glad, I'm glad that the timing worked out where we wound up there last, and I got to see that. It was, it was really a true inspiration. So we'll talk about your politics, but you're running for family court judge. Yes, Sam. Probably should have started with, hey, by the way, this is Matt Rich, and he's running for family court judge. Well, but, but, but I have the, other the, I have other qualities too. Yeah, we're gonna, we're going to get to some of those qualities. But you're so you're a DA. You I went to private practice. Yes, you you have a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of experience representing children, being involved yes. in cases involving children, um, a lot of attorney for the child work. Yes, tons. But so tell us, you decided how do you decide you want to be a family court judge? Well. Um, you know, when I left the DA's office, I think everybody assumed that I was just going to go out and automatically all I was going to do was criminal defense. In fact, I, I, I remember specifically saying to myself, um, all right, you're going to do defense on the state side. We're going to hold off on getting into the federal stuff. Let's see if we have the bandwidth for that. And immediately I started getting assignments in family court. And I think that it was just a natural fit from the first day. Um, because, you know, you, Bob, you were, you were, I think, one of the first prosecutors assigned to the integrated domestic violence part. Yeah, good memory, man. Yeah. Um, and what that is is where parties have a criminal case that they're involved in with a victim and a, and a defendant, and then they also have family court cases going on at the same time. And I did a ton of work in there as a prosecutor. You were assigned there yeah, exclusively. We we got to drop uh, Justice Alex Renzi. He's oh, running for yeah. Supreme Court. Yeah. So, so I did twenty jury trials in domestic violence court. You know, he, you I, know I what he said that's more than all yeah. the other prosecutors ever. You know, he was at the same meetings I was at last night, and he made mention that he went back. So he's running for Supreme this year. Please vote for Judge Renzi. He's he's one of the best. Um, he said that Bias County's done something like four hundred jury trials, and I said, you know, Judge, of those, how many do you think? I've done with you. And he said, I think about 12 to 15. So your answer would be? 22 or 3. Yeah. 22 or 3. And, yeah, that's right. He was, I think it was Judge Bellini was first in, the late Judge Bellini was first in IDV, and then Judge Renzi replaced her, um, if I have my, my order right. But they were among the two first that started the program. And that's where we got our education, I think, in family court, how 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 it worked. And... It just when I went out on my own, you know, I, 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 like you did. I immediately. I think we were in the same class. Actually, we we enrolled for the. Yeah, I know we were. We were in the attorney for same attorney for the child training class, when when we took it. Um, that work has been the real joy of my practice for the last twelve years. Is to do the the acronym is AFC Attorney for the Child Work, where you are working with and representing the kids in the family court cases. I, I look at it as a continuation of, of the work I did at the DAs. And again, the experiences I have had, you know, are, are absolutely incredible. I, I've been with kids in the absolute poorest and most destitute of circumstances. I've been with kids who live in mansions in Pittsburgh and everything in between. And you know, the issues are the same. It, it, the adults in their lives are in conflict. How do you help them navigate through that? And, you know, it, it, I, part of the inspiration I draw is from other judges who I've worked with in this, you know, in, in this arena. Judge John Gallagher, Judge Jim Vizana, two, two of my absolute favorites, Judge Stacy Romeo. All of them would say, Judge Nasser, got to wrench in Judge Joe Nasser. Um, all of them take the approach that the focus of the family court case, the focus of the case, has to be on the child. Adults, sort your you-know-what out. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's going to put these kids in a position where they have a chance, where they have a chance to get through these situations? And that work has 
it's stunned me in the last 12 years that how, how much of it I've done. I mean, I never, I, th I think I remember saying like, well, if I don't get a lot of family court work, I'll just go over and do federal criminal work. I have never done any federal criminal work of any significance. <laughs> I've never had the time, you know? I mean, I've, it's, uh, the family court stuff has just been, uh, that's been, the, that's been a much larger part of what I've done than I ever anticipated. So t you go to these committees. Mm -hmm. And every town has a committee, yep. and uh, you're in the process of hopefully becoming the endorsed Republican conservative candidate. Is that the that uh, is the plan? Yeah. So, so what do you tell well, tell the people who's never been to a committee? Oh, okay, what sure. Like, what's that like? You went to three last night. You, yeah, you must know what it's like. Well, I was also lucky enough to be the Republican leader in the town of Penfield um, for the last four years leading up to this. So the rules say that when you throw your hat in the ring for judge, you cannot hold a, a position on an executive committee of any town or county committee. I was also on the executive committee for the county Republican Party. Um, worked under three great leaders there, um, Bill Napier, um, Bernie Yacovangelo, and now David Dunning. Proud to call all three of those gentlemen friends. At a committee, uh, at, at, its, at its base, the, the neat thing is you're going to hear from the officials in your town about what's going on in your town. So, like, when I was a Penfield leader, we would get a report every month from Tony LaFountain, who was the supervisor in Penfield for, you know, 12 years, and now Marie Sinti. And what are we talking about? Like, you know, well, we bought, you know, two new snow plows, or they're about to put up a pickleball court in the park. You know, it's, 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 it's the nitty-gritty of, of town government. But more than that, over the years, it's a forum for candidates to come in, both on, you know, whether it's... Um, the federal level, like we, you know, we've had, like last year, LaRon Singletary was at our multiple of our events in Penfield. Um, you know, county candidates, judicial candidates, uh, you know, come out and uh, and speak to the committee of members because these are really the people that on a, on that level of the party are out doing the legwork. The people that put the signs in the ground and put the door hangers on the doors and knock on doors petitions. and yeah, that petitions. Yeah, thanks, Bree. Now I think about doing petitions in the cold. That's coming up here, but. Yeah. Uh, Petitions are, yeah. are something. But that's that's <laughs> local. I mean, you heard the phrase, all politics is local. That That's it at, at its base. And each town has has a committee, um, at least on the Republican side. You know, the city has a committee. And this is where, this is this is government in action. It's where it starts. And the new leader is Matt Pisson? Yes, my uh, good friend Matt Pisson, who's uh, law partners with my wife at Evans Fox in Brighton. Um Matt and I were, were in the DA's office with you as well, Bob. Um, he's going to do an unbelievable job. He's already doing an unbelievable job. So, what else you got, what else you got for Matt? I, I, mean, I can talk to Matt forever. I mean, I don't. <laughs> you so, keep going. Well, I enjoyed working for Matt. I think that's probably come through um, mm -hmm. here, but. So you become a boss. You're a relatively young guy. You become a boss yeah. of too young to be honest of, with you. A bunch of you know people, pretty much out of law school and mm -hmm. aggressive. I was six years there. out of law school when I. Yeah, you're six years. So you're 31, 32 years old when yeah, you get the job. Something like that. I'm yeah. 26 years old. In some ways, we're peers. And yeah, that, absolutely. And um, so well, I had so, to be honest with you. I had two people that were my peers that reported to me. If you think about it, I had. So there was a, a lawyer by the name of Justin Hill, who is now at the DA's office in Livingston. He's the second assistant down there. And I had another lawyer named Mike McNellis, who had come from the Niagara County District Attorney's Office. And, and they had just joined, you know, the Monroe office at a time when, you know, you got to work your way through local courts. I'm these guys' bosses. Like, I, I'm, they have to report to me. <laughs> I mean, Justin and I went to high school together, you know. I mean, I'm not sure I had anything to teach them, but... Um, but, but I think you did teach a lot of people. Yeah. And so what was your strategy, just from a leadership perspective? What was, you get the job, you say, okay, what did you think? What, I mean. Well, what, what I thought right off the bat was this is a great opportunity because I, I love the teaching aspect of it. And what, I, what we had been able to do at that point, we take all of our training up in child abuse and we would teach the rest of our peers at the office, right? We would spread that out. We would have those office CLEs and things like that. People would come to us from other bureaus if they had, if there was an aspect of their case that, you know, somehow touched on, on our expertise. But I loved, and I'm sure you did, and everybody who did when they worked there, the thousands of lawyers have come through there, 
they loved their time on the third floor. The third floor is the local court's floor. That is when you are surrounded by this group of people that, I mean, most of the people that I worked with are still friends of mine, lifelong friends of mine. It is just such a great, at the time, it was usually took about two years to cycle through there. And I remember, you know, the early days of being a real lawyer, yeah. you're, your mind is exploding. You're, right. you're like, you're learning every day and you're working right. with a bunch of people who are also learning every mm-hmm. day. And it's a, it's a time of uh, personal growth. It's also mm-hmm. probably your first job. You get a paycheck. You're living like, in you're not making an hourly rate you right. know, or you're not getting tips when you deliver the pizza. Yeah. You're, was, uh, you got an apartment probably mm-hmm. and not a whole you have professional responsibility, but it's also a time where most people don't have a lot of right. personal responsibilities and all fun. Yes. Um, we certainly, uh, had enjoyed some activities together after work from time to time. Uh, but that also, that bred a, um, a camaraderie and a closeness among us. And to come, to have the opportunity to come back and do for you guys what, I mentioned Tim Prosperi, um, Vince Rizzo, who was the boss down there when I was on the third floor, what they did for me. Um, you know, other people in those positions. I mean, I think of Bill Gargan when he had that position or, or Chris and Muso when she had that position. Um, you know, it, it I, 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 I loved every minute of it. And I loved, I loved being with you guys every day. I loved the energy. I loved, I loved having you come in. I still had my own trials to do. And I remember, you know, you guys would come watch. Um, or I'd send you off to go watch other lawyers in the office or other defense lawyers that I thought you, you know, you should see. And, that's where the real learning happens. Yeah, so there's a there's a thing. Another, I'll, I'll tell one more Matt Rich story. So oh God. Matt, Matt did this thing when he was the boss, and yes. he would come in, he would come into the office. You, like we all had our own little law offices, mm-hmm. you know. And he closed he would close the door, and he would take out he would pull five files out of your file cabinet, and he's like, "I don't take notes. I don't tell anybody. This is for you. This is so you can be better." It was a, it wasn't about ego. It oh, was gosh, actually yeah. it was about how can I as your boss help you become better? And he would sit down and we would burn through these five files and say, hey, if I was working on this, here's some things you might want to do. Maybe this doesn't look right to me. This does look right to me. This is for your benefit to become a better, mm-hmm. uh, more highly skilled at your trade. I feel more, like that's something that you've done with us as well, though. Like you've taken well, you know, that it's, same approach. It's, with- it, but it's not about... It's really for that person, right? It's, it's that's for what I'm saying. It's you like or anybody else who works here, and, and yeah, I think you also, as a boss, have done that for us. Is what right. I'm it's saying. Like, where can we? Where can you improve for right. your benefit, not for my benefit, not for the end of the year review? I'm not writing this stuff down. This is just like, can mm-hmm. we get better in the next ten minutes? Like, how do we is, get yeah. better? Yeah, and, and you do that every single day. All I ever asked of you guys was what kitty or dog or any of the other bosses asked of us. It's just. I, if if you lose, if you go in there and you get a negative result and you were prepared and you were pushing forward and being aggressive, I can, I can live with that. I just expected, I need you to bust your tail. I need you to be ready. I need you to be fair to the people that you're in there, you know, standing in for the victims. And we'll let the system handle the rest of it. That's all we can do. Yeah, so, and then I worked for Matt for a period of time and, and then I went and worked for Kitty. Mm-hmm. And, Me too. Um, <laughs> oh, you, what, what were you? I you, was her secretary when she did matrimonial. Oh, okay, and then yes. Jeanette, her paralegals, my aunt. Oh, okay. All right, now it's all coming together. Yeah. yeah, I remember very distinctly her being. Well, I mean, I was just in court yesterday with Joan. I mean, Joan's a a legend. Um, Joan, Joan's going to be our next guest. You got to oh get her God. on here. You've got you to got convince to. her. <laughs> you, you're going to need a two part episode. No, she is five yes. part. Five part. You know, episode. it's funny. It's funny about her. So I have a, I have a 12 year old daughter, uh, Molly, who thinks she's 19, but that's another story. And you know, her mother's an attorney, and my my wife Allison is just she does like transactional work, you know, real estate things like that. My, my wife is an outstanding attorney. She doesn't. She'll never get her to admit that, but she's unbelievable. And and I was talking to Molly, and you know, we were talking like, listen, your mother is a professional. Your mother is ex- insanely talented at what she does. She works her tail off. And I think Molly asked like, well, do you know any other, you know, lady attorneys? And I said, well, I know millions of them, Molly. But you know, I think of I I told her about Joan. I mean, Joan was a pioneer in the legal community. Well, Joan. 
Well, tell us who Joan is for anyone. Joan O'Byrne is the number one matrimonial attorney for right. 100 miles in a circle. She's represented professional athletes, professional right. musicians, tons of famous people. But more importantly than that, she sold the most Girl Scout cookies in the whole United <laughs> States when she was 11. She went to the United mm -hmm. States Supreme Court twice before yep. she was 30 years old. And she was the only woman in her law school class at Cal Berkeley. And the men in her class would not talk to her. They, their strategy was, we're going to pretend you're invisible because you shouldn't be here because you're a woman. Right. She's like well, a trailblazer for women Oh, my attorneys. gosh. Well, the definition of trailblazer. They know her. They yeah, know you're darn right. Now. Let's also mention she's a tennis champion. Oh, yeah. She has, I believe, traveled the world. She's 85 and won the club championship at the number one tennis yep. club, the, the Valley Club, when she was 80. And she drives a cream-colored Rolls Royce with a burgundy top, which you're going to see from 10 miles away when she's driving it down the road. Right. Uh, an absolute legend, but it, you know, I, I, so I'm, you know, I, she was an example I gave Molly of. Listen, you can do anything, anything, that you put your mind to, and it's people like Joan who've blazed the trail, for you know, I mean, Bree, I think you would you would say that you know the professional opportunities you've had, um, you can trace back to that, or or you know, I mean, think of all the yes. Think of all the women we worked with and for at the DA's office and, and elsewhere. So, you know, it's it's nice to be able to have role models that I can point my children to to look at. And, you know, that's another blessing we have in this business. There's a lot of role models we can point to and say, you know, look, they, they, they overcame things or they accomplished things that people put obstacles in their way, and uh, they overcame them. And, I mean... Joan, I, I can't wait until that episode, Bob. You, you, mm -hmm. That cannot be a one-parter. No. You've got to really, we, you know, I'll give you another example. In fact, I was just having this conversation the other day with John Speranza. So John is an absolute legend. So, uh, let me, yeah, uh, sure. The reason the podcast exists is because I went to lunch with Joan and John Speranza. Oh, my gosh. And they should have recorded that. Well, I, that's what I sat there with my jaw on the table for two straight hours, and they're trying to one up each other, I think. <laughs> and it's one story after. Yeah. I'm like, we got to record the lawyers. We got to get the lawyers yeah. in here and talk to them. Yeah, I mean, so John, I mean, y y back in the back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, the mob wars, and, and or or you know, there were corruption cases or you know, f massive trials. It's funny. I, I just bought this subscription to the archive of the newspaper. So I, I, one of my office mates and I were sitting around the other day, and I put in John's name. The articles would blow your mind, Bob, that came up. But 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 my point is the other night I'm talking to John and you know, he's he's you know, in in, in the the later stages of his career, I think about, he'd tell you about, that. He's about eighty years yeah. old. Yeah. Still dresses way better than I've ever even imagined that I could possibly dress. But I said, John, you know, you gotta you have to write a book. You must write a book. I think Joan should write a book. Yes. And um I'd be the first in line to buy either of those because, you know and you think about Here's the thing, Bob. How kind have those two people been to you or me? How, how willing have they been to share their knowledge and their experiences? Both of them. Well, they give you the we're still in the office. I went yeah. to lunch with Joan 10 years ago, and I said, I'm looking for some space. She goes, well, the office across the hall is available. Gosh. I'll call the guy for you. Are you interested? Yeah. Of course. I met, her, I met her one time. We went to lunch one mm -hmm. time. She's like, oh, yeah, just moving across the hall. We've been here ever since. Well, my, I, I, you know, I'll tell you a similar story about the the the. My landlord now in my office in the first federal building, Vince Moyer, who um, the day after I left the DA's office, the phone rings. I have never met the man before. He's like, I want you to come down to my office tomorrow. And the next thing I knew, I had, I had work. I had advice. He didn't have to do that. And, and, I, and he's, he's become an incredible friend to me since then. And, and, you know, I see him every day now. And it's... This is what I, I hope that as you and I, you know, I hope to do it as a family court judge. You know, I, 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 I hope to work with the next generation and help the next generation of, you know, people, attorneys, and people in the legal field. Because we've been given tremendous gifts by, gosh, you think, you th I mean, I, I think we mentioned Larry, another guy, Kenny Highland. Remember Kenny at the DA's office? He was first assistant. Um, Bruce Goldman when he was at the DA's office, um, Judge, Judge Joanne Winslow. Oh, my gosh. I, I remember watching so many different trials that she did when she was at the DA's. Just, and, and so giving. 
you know, you could you could go up to any of these people when we were there, and they would sit with you and help you figure it out. I was in town court. I remember I, got, I used to go to work early. I don't anymore. But the, uh, <laughs> you have I, kids now, Bob. Well, so. yeah, you got to drop them off and stuff like that. But I used to go to work early. Like, well, lawyers don't go to work early, sure. but I did. And I had to go do a hearing out in Webster Town Court. And I'm like, oh, I knew. I'm like, I don't know how to do this hearing. So I'm like, I hit the elevator button. I'm like, I'm going to find somebody at this office. I, Tell me I, you hit eight, please. I, you I, hit eight. I hit eight. Oh, I you did right the elf? You just I, I, I didn't know. I'd only been there about three weeks. I didn't, okay. I didn't like know the whole culture. So I hit the button. I walked down the hall. There's nobody there is the problem. Mm-hmm. So I, I walked in the office, and you know who I found? Brian DeCarlos. And uh, mm-hmm. he, he was new to VFO, but to me, he, was, he might as well have been yeah. 50 years old. Right. And he sat down. He got out a book. He highlighted the book. He gave me a yellow pad. He wrote out my questions. He goes, here, go ask those questions. And that's what I did. I went to Webster Town yeah. Court, and uh, I, you know we, get, we won the hearing. And you figured it out, we right? We won the hearing, and it was, it was okay. Um, I want to talk about one more thing. Okay. Obviously, sports has been a big part of your life. Sports mm-hmm. has been a big part of my life. There's a lot of crossover, in my yeah. opinion, about high school athletes, college athletes, mm-hmm. and trial lawyers. So the, I'm sure you've thought about this. What, well, what? so you, you asked me about the press conference and, you know, sort of walking up and answering some of those questions. Um, I always wanted the puck on my stick. I don't know how else to say it. Like, I, I if, you know, in, or, you know, in, in baseball, I always wanted the ball hit to me. You know, and that's, 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 that's an instinct, I think, that, you know, you were a soccer player. I'm sure it was the same. Like, you want the ball. Yeah, high school hoops player. Yeah, you want but, the ball. To me, I think it's you learn to have this um, conflict, right? You mm-hmm. go play a game, and you're going to try to win, and I'm going to try to win, and at the end, the game is over, and you, you, you try to move Shake on. hands, yeah. You and, always shake hands and accept the result, you know. My experience has been a lot of the really good trial lawyers have this adversarial thing in their youth where they learn how to compete Mm -hmm. without going crazy and people who haven't done that and they become a a litigator at 25 years old well they've never butted heads without going bananas and then Mm -hmm. it it, they they go too far or they don't go far enough or they don't know how to take the stress that's my theory I don't so well, play sports before you go to law school is that what you're saying <laughs> well you better learn how to play golf because that's a lot of business gets done but you know my our other shared passion i think is skiing right and there's a sign at whiteface mountain i know you know the one and it says it's on one of the poles going up to the summit and it says skiers must learn to adapt to all conditions it's that's the human spirit that's what it says and you know it has all those little kind of signs up there because it was the olympic mountain and that's that's part of it too. I mean, when you're when you're skiing, think about some of the trips we took. Like there were years we went when it rained, and by the time we got to the bottom of a mountain, we looked like a glazed donut. Yeah. There were years when it was fog. Uh, my dad will still tell you about that. The year we almost killed him in the fog on Weiss Face Mountain. But that, that, that's, but the point is, you have to adapt. And and the only person that can do that when you're on the ski mountain and you're at speed is you. You have to you have to adjust. Um, golf's the same way. I mean, golf is, and, and golf has become a huge part of my life as I've gotten older and unable to skate with any discernible speed anymore because I'm, I'm not 19. I'm reminded every time I get out on the rink. Um, <laughs> but golf is, it's between the ears. You know, you, you know I, I, I tell people, the, the really great golfers, and I, I am – I'm so blessed to have a bunch of them in my life that I'm really good friends with, guys that are just incredible players, district champions, uh, state amateur competitors, things like that. It's not the physical so much as the mental, and it's, it's the ability to, if something doesn't go your way, learn from what happened. Don't forget it. Put it behind you and don't dwell on it. Don't forget it, but move on to the next thing. And... That is, that is trial law in a nutshell. You, you have to accumulate these experiences. The cost of accumulating those experiences sometimes is pain. And yeah. it's, it's, it's disappointment. I know? had this high school hoop coach, Bill Thompson, and he would always talk about, can you handle adversity? Whether that's today, right. whether that's we just lost the ball game, whether it's you're not going to start, whether it's your trial, mm-hmm. your business isn't going the way you want to. And that to me, I'll never forget. 
uh, that's it, a coach. That's you know, that's the job of a coach is right. to impart those kind of lessons. You know, but taking it from the other side, one of the other blessings in my life is I've I'm involved with a charity called Challenger Miracle Field. Um, it's a field in Webster uh, that we've built over the years that is designed um, for children uh, who have disabilities to be able to compete in a variety of different sports that they would not be able to compete in otherwise. Baseball, we use it for soccer, we use it for flag football. And the joy that you see the kids experience when, they, when they're out there on this beautiful facility. I mean, the next thing we're about to do is put in lights I mean, these kids are going to think they're at Fenway Park or Yankee Stadium, and that's what they think in their mind. And it's the there's joy a, that to be baseball, able to. There's a baseball field there. There is. If yeah. I'm not mistaken, it is a scale model of Yankee Stadium. Uh, I don't. I, I gotta have to ask my friend uh, Ron Camp about that. He's uh, he's the one that. Does, I, I believe it's a scale of a, a professional baseball okay. field. So you, you can get back to us on that one. I'll I'll, I'll ask about that, but um, sports has that power to transport you. And these kids forget for an hour and a half or two hours that they, that they have different abilities than, than other kids. They're just out there being kids. And you know that they're gonna take, they're on teams, they're gonna take the idea of being a teammate and working together, and they're gonna apply it to the, all the other challenges in their life. And you know, going back to our shared experience at the DA's office, we were a team. You know, we, we supported each other. We, we helped each other out. And, you know, that, that aspect, I think, translates also into, you know, a family court situation. You know, you think about we have accumulated all this knowledge of what resources are out there to help people, right? I'm sure in working with some of the veterans you've worked with, you've seen them face challenges, right? You know the right agencies to send them to where they're going to get assistance, it's about assembling a team to help people to overcome the challenges. And, and that, that translates, like I said, into family court where you, you, you're working with a family. There's conflict. There is a lot of times mental health issues, a lot of times chemical dependency issues. The kids, you know, they're suffering both emotionally, academically. You had better know how to assemble the right people around a situation like that to help whether it be psychologists, whether it be, you know, counselors, whether it be, you know, bringing in certain uh, aspects, whether it be religious, whether it be medical, anything. And we think about all the knowledge we've accumulated over the years about how to help people. That's also what this is all about. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be helping people when we do this. And that's the goal. When you have a client, you know, you have to find a way to help them overcome whatever challenge they've come to you with. It's not always easy, but it's worth it in the end most of the time. Got Any, uh, departing words of wisdom for us? Um, I couldn't imagine a better podcast debut than this. Um, I'm, I love you, buddy. I'm proud of you. Um, you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're amazing. And, um, it's, it, it's my honor to be here and talk about all this stuff with you. I mean, we have, we've been able to share so many things, both personally and professionally. And uh, I, I, I can't, if you have some of the episodes you've suggested to me that you, you, you have coming up, um, people need to subscribe to that because it's going to be awesome. And you uh, heard it here. Subscribe uh, now. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> like and subscribe. That concludes this episode of the King Law Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and check out our socials at King Law Attorneys. And if you've happened to have been injured or charged with a crime, now you know who to call. King Law. Take charge.